Now you've got some of the basic concepts of electromagnetic radiation down, but there's also some memorization that has to happen so that as we talk about different materials and different regions of the EMR, you'll know what we're referring to and what their characteristics might be. So if, for example, you should be familiar with the units that are typically used for electromagnetic radiation and how to, say, convert from meters back down to nanometers. Um, you should know which wavelengths are the shortest, gamma rays, and essentially the order. So you should know that infrared rays are longer wavelengths than visible light or any of the other um, wavelengths down below the visible spectrum. You should know that radio waves are the longest wavelengths that we have within the EMR. We have microwave and radar somewhere in between. So spend a little bit of time getting familiar with this. And if you don't particularly like that one, um, sometimes people think <laughs> the other way around. It's weird for me to see the longer wavelengths on the left, but whatever works for you, um, take a little time and uh, take some notes on just the basic terminology for the electromagnetic spectrum. We're also going to spend a little bit of time learning about some basic different classes of surface materials and their typical spectrum. So when we are talking about a continuous set of wavelengths, so in other words, uh, you have a sensor that can measure every single wavelength, say between some certain range here, we have between blue wavelengths and out through the mid-infrared. So when you have a continuous spectrum like that, you're really able to see different absorbance features um, that we know are related to different chemical and physical properties of the material. Uh, and that really does help you identify just by looking at the shape of this spectral curve what surface material you're looking at and then it can get uh, even more specific so we might have the vegetation here in green but different types of vegetation will look very different um, and especially in terms of this near infrared plateau they'll have some basic structures that are common like these chlorophyll absorption bands um, and these water absorption bands but how the rest of that looks may be dependent upon the species or the density uh, or the condition of that material that, that vegetation in particular so you're, we're going to go over a couple different major classes and you should be able to identify these just by looking at the spectra we'll start with water Water is particularly good at transmitting and then ultimately absorbing, depending on the depth, uh, wavelengths all across the typical spectrum that sensors read. So from these blue wavelengths over here to the mid-infrared wavelengths. We obviously do have sensors that read much shorter wavelengths or much longer wavelengths, but they're not typically um, utilized for Earth observations. So this is a pretty common range, uh, this time in micrometers. And just for a little quickie quiz, if I were to convert, say for example, this 0.5 micrometers to nanometers, see if you can pause and figure out what that would be. Okay, I'm going to assume you took a chance. <laughs> so this would actually be 500 nanometers. This would be 1,000 nanometers, 1,500 nanometers. So, so water is pretty good at uh, transmitting and then ultimately absorbing water across all of the wavelengths. But you do, uh, at times, get a little bit more reflectance um, at some of these shorter wavelengths, which is why the water will appear blue. So it's not always this straightforward that water is just this flat line. Um, and so if we were to look at this and break it down into the components, we know that water is a very strong absorber of most wavelengths, but particularly those near-infrared wavelengths. So when we're using sensors um, that have a near-infrared band, that's typically the one that we would use to identify water, bo water bodies. There are some of the shorter wavelengths, so for most sensors this would be the visible region, that can show up as very bright if you have smooth water, and that again is that sun glint that's caused by the specular reflection off of the water. Um, it's also impacted by any type of suspended material in the water, uh, silt or, or algae, um, so it really can be altered in the visible wavelengths by these the different composition or components that are within the water. And it's interesting, so while water itself uh, can absorb and transmit almost all wavelengths, the materials that may be suspended in the water um, can't, and so they tend to reflect much more light, particularly in those visible wavelengths. So you can tend to see um, 
where water that's particularly uh, full of sediment is looking much more grayish or Similarly, when there's algae in the water, that is a form of vegetation, so it's going to be absorbing more of those blues and reds, meaning that what can ultimately be reflected back are the green wavelengths. So we get the green appearance of water with a, a high concentration of algae. Vegetation is the other class of material that you should be very familiar with. There's, again, these absorption, these chlorophyll absorption regions in the blue and in the red wavelengths with uh, proportionately more reflectance in the green wavelengths, basically because it's not being absorbed by any of the structures within the leaf. But then there is this tremendous near-infrared plateau where reflectance is highest for vegetation followed by a couple of water absorption bands. So if you were interested in uh, vegetation water content or canopy water content or some stress related to drought, you could be looking at how much absorption there was by water. So just as an example of something an analyst would have to think about, if you were looking for severity of drought stress, and so you would expect that the vegetation might have lower concentrations of water in the foliage, what do you think would happen to these two absorbance troughs? And maybe pause for a second and think about that. If we have a vegetation experiencing stress, how will these, drought stress specifically, how will these two uh, water absorbance features change in this reflectance spectra? Okay, hopefully you paused and thought about that. Essentially, if we have less water because there's drought stress, then we would not have as much absorbance here. So you would actually see the reflectance in these two troughs increase. So you would not see as deep of an absorbance feature here if there were drought stress. If it's easier for you to think about this uh, in words, just remember that we have this typical green peak within the visible wavelengths with the, the red and the blue troughs where there's chlorophyll absorbance for vegetation, uh, very high reflectance in that near-infrared plateau uh, that's really directly related to canopy density leaf structure rather than the chemistry or the chlorophyll chemistry. And then we have these uh, water absorbance features a little bit further out in the mid and far infrared. This is a fun one. So again, if you think about this being the visible wavelength, what have you seen on the Earth's surface that is extremely bright? So a surface material that reflects almost 100%. Um, and you know, you might say, oh, someone put mirrors on the ground. I'm talking about a naturally occurring uh, surface. And think about this for a second. Also notice that we have these same very strong water absorption troughs out here. So what can you think of that has high water content yet is highly reflective in those visible wavelengths? Well, hopefully you came up with snow. And this is um, a really common uh, appearance for snow, although it can change depending on the water content. What's really interesting though is that um, clouds will also appear very bright in these visible wavelengths. And so to distinguish snow from clouds, you'll tend to use more of these water absorption bands because the snow has a much higher density of water, which means it's going to absorb much more deeply in these troughs. So if we had a cloud, it might look similar, um, but probably would not have these massive dips in these water absorption bands. When we get into man-made materials, it becomes uh, a little bit more complicated because we can mix and make things so differently. But we can, if we know that one of these, for example, is asphalt and one of these is concrete, you should be able to use just your general understanding of reflectance to figure out which is which. So if you were to describe visually what you see when you look at asphalt, a paved road, we typically think of something dark like tar. So it makes sense that this lower reflectance would be indicative of that darker color. And when we think of concrete, we think of sidewalks. They tend to be a little bit brighter, and that would make sense that we would have higher reflectance in these visible wavelengths. But other than that, they're both pretty, well, pretty boring. Soils and minerals tend to have very distinct spectral signatures. Um, I can't, there is no real generalization, but this is really useful uh, for remote sensing analysts. So consider if you were trying to distinguish the difference between quartz here in the orange 
and kaolinite here in the red, um, you would want to look for those areas of maximum divergence from each other. So maybe we would want to be looking um, in these sort of greenish red wavelengths right around in here. They both have an interesting absorbance feature here, which makes me think that uh, perhaps there is some similar mineral composition within them. Um, but there's obviously some very distinct uh, qualities within or between the two of them as well. It might be useful to spend a little bit of time at the interactive website that I have linked on Blackboard to sort of play with some of these different spectra and get used to what different surface materials will typically look like. Um, and I will post that on Blackboard. So really all we're left with though is now figuring out, well great, we know we have energy coming from the sun and it interacts with the Earth's surface. But to get to the sensor, well in fact to get to the surface in the first place, this electromagnetic radiation has to interact with the molecules and atoms in the Earth's atmosphere. So we will save that for next week. And I think now you are all ready to go on in and take your video quiz.